Tonight's event, uh, tonight's lecture, is also part of the Peterborough Community Foundation's uh, Seven Days of Green, uh, and we're the executive director from the foundation with this, uh, this evening. Um, a, and a series of events leading up to Earth Day uh, that are happening in the community, uh, and, it's, and uh, you can check their website to find out more details if you want. But this this talk had actually been organized earlier in the in the year. Uh, Ryan O'Connor is a research fellow in the Frost Center and um, suggested that he would be willing to give uh, a talk on his research, uh, living up to the expectations that the Frost Center has of their research associates and willingly acknowledges their contributions to all that we do. Uh, so I was very pleased um, and it was his suggestion that we organize it uh, in and around Earth Day, which seemed most appropriate. Ryan uh, has been at Trent as a Shirk postdoc, uh, working with Stephen Bocking um, uh, over the last couple of years. He has his PhD from the University of Western Ontario, uh, where he worked with Ellen McKechn, and his uh, MA from Queens, and he's originally from PEI, and that will connect with at least one person I know in the audience. And his undergraduate degree uh, is, in, is from the University of Prince Edward Island. And from what I could read of your work, it was in island studies. So you did a lot of work on on, on history, uh, and uh, that program there, the island studies program, is certainly one that has a lot of resonances with what we do in the Frost Center. Um, he's currently preparing a manuscript um, with a very good press, UBC Press, which is the one that I'm uh, uh, working with currently at the moment, too. Uh, his book is called Toronto the Green, The Origins of Canada's Environmental Movement and I think it's based uh, on his dissertation. While uh, at Trent, he worked with uh, Stephen Bocking to uh, edit a volume called The Great Green North, The History of Canada's Environmental Movement. He's well published for such a young scholar. I recently had a piece come out in Ontario History, um, Acadiensis, uh, and various other uh, publications, and has been active also in the community, I think, working on this topic. Um, I think draws you into the public uh, and the public discussion around uh, issues around uh, environmental activism and, and uh, its history and its ongoing, uh, the ongoing need, I would say. Ryan's talk tonight is called Pollution Probe and the Not-So-Secret Beginnings of Environmental Activism in Ontario, and I'd like to ask you to uh, help me welcome him tonight. Where I'd like to begin to bring it to the present. And the fact is, it seems that there's no secret that our government holds the environmental movement, well, in a hostile stance, right? They seem to be portraying environmentalists as radicals and troublemakers. Just give you a few examples. January 2012, Natural Resource Minister Joe Oliver while discussing opposition to Enbridge's Northern Gateway Pipeline, spoke openly about environmental and other radical groups that threatened to hijack our regulatory system to achieve their radical ideological agenda. And he also accused environmentalists in this country of being funded from outside the country. The following month, Public Safety Minister Vic Taves released a new anti-terrorism strategy that listed environmentalists among perceived threats. And amidst this increasing attention of the government and their hostility towards the environmental movement, the Globe and Mail uncovered a CSIS document from 2008 that branded Greenpeace a multi-issue extremist group. And these groups, according to CSIS, have demonstrated the intent and the capability to carry out attacks against critical infrastructure in Canada. Yeah. So I take it people here, by and large, are familiar with Greenpeace. We have an image here. I believe this is taken from uh, Rex Weiler's book on Greenpeace. So there are our best known environmental activist group in Canada, probably in the whole world. They're known for their machismo, their direct action tactics. Perfect example, they were founded in 1971. What were they doing? Well, they weren't happy that the United States was setting off nuclear blasts in the Aleutian Islands. So what's their solution? 
they get a boat and they decide to take it out to the nuclear detonation zone, perhaps stop the, the nuclear blasts, perhaps, well, just draw attention to it. And quickly thereafter, expand it into a global phenomenon. But all in all, Greenpeace is not what I would say is your typical environmental activist group. Now it's been said that Canada had two major environmental activist groups, two most significant, uh, during the late 60s and the early 70s. And this was, of course, Greenpeace, but also Pollution Probe. Now, again, I'm assuming most of us are familiar with Greenpeace. Just by a show of hands, how many people are familiar with Pollution Probe? All right, wow. This is not normal. <laughs> But I like it a lot. <laughs> this is very good. But these are two very different groups. Greenpeace, they come out of the counterculture, out of the new left of the period. Pollution Pro, very much out of the mainstream. So again, here's a familiar picture, Pollution Pro. You can contrast that with Greenpeace, where you have the people ready to get in front of boats that were in the last picture whaling. Here we have Pollution Probe sitting in a tree, not looking very threatening at all. Now my contention is that the Canadian environmental movement developed more akin to Pollution Probe than Greenpeace. I have a couple of goals in this talk. I want to give you a background on the origins and early activities of Pollution Probe, which I would say is Canada's first high-profile environmental activist group. And second, I just want to demonstrate the mainstream nature of the movement. Now, they say every story has a beginning. And for, for Pollution Probe, that beginning is a CBC documentary that was broadcast in 1967 called The Air of Death. Now, to give you a bit of context, I spoke with Monty Hummel. He was a former Pollution Probe employee and current president emeritus of the World Wildlife Fund of Canada. And he provided this explanation. As he told me, in the late 1960s, there were no ministers of the environment, no environmental protection acts, and pollution was a brand new word. Well, at this time, Larry Gosnell, he was a filmmaker at the CBC in the Farm and Fishery Department, and he decided he wanted to create a three-part primetime series exposing the problem of pollution in Canada. The first part to be broadcast was The Air of Death, which looked at air pollution in Canada. It was hosted by Stanley Burke, who at the time was quite famous. He was the host of the national news on the CBC. Now, this documentary is significant for a number of reasons. One, it got a lot of eyeballs on it. It preempted the Ed Sullivan show on a Sunday evening. So there's a large built-in audience. It also demonstrated that air pollution wasn't just a problem in the United States, it was right here in Canada and needed to be addressed. And it's also significant because it demonstrated that air pollution isn't just a problem in cities. They had a very contentious segment that showed air pollution's problem in rural Canada as well. Uh, they went to Dunville, Ontario, and they looked at the electric production company, also known as ERCO, their superphosphate plant in the area. Now, it had long been known that this plant was causing trouble for the uh, well, vegetation and for the farm animals. But in this documentary, they came up with the, uh, well, they alleged that it was also making the human population sick, possibly killing some of the locals. So of course, Erco is not happy with this. There's a backlash. They're using private and public channels, trying to discredit Larry Gosnell, Stanley Burke, and the CBC. And it results in two inquiries. One provincial that was headed by George Edward Hall, who was recently retired president of the University of Western Ontario. He was a friend of ERCO and the provincial government. And what happens there? Well, it's a provincial inquiry, so the CBC doesn't feel they have to participate, so they don't. This is, well, it's a, play terms. This isn't a very third, well, oh geez, why am I being kind here? The 
It's a witch hunt. They go out of their way to, if the evidence doesn't prove it, they allege it anyways, that the CBC didn't properly investigate the problem, that they're being scaremongers, all of that. It ends their report with the suggestion that the people of Dunville sue the CBC for talking about pollution and scaring away possible customers for their produce. And this is followed by a CRTC inquiry, and it's much more thorough, a little more uh, reasonable. They do speak to the CBC, they, the main figures there testify. At the end of the day, the CRTC put out a report that said, it is the opinion of the committee that the air of death may well have been one of the most thoroughly researched programs in the history of television broadcasting. So there's a vindication right there. Now the efforts to vilify the people behind the air of death, well, it angered a lot of people. Among those concerned was the staff at the University of Toronto newspaper, The Varsity. Particularly concerned, they're particularly concerned about this because the vice chairman of the board at ERCO was Oman Salant, who just happened to be chancellor at the University of Toronto. Now Salant's a very prominent figure he also served at the time as chairman of the Science Council of Canada. So the staff at the, the varsity decide they're going to write a brief to the CRTC inquiry to support the CBC. At this time, the news editor at the varsity, Sherry Brideson, she decided she'd meet with the head of the zoology department, Donald Chant, for help and some advice while writing this brief. Now, the staff at the varsity had been doing their own recent investigations of pollution problems in Toronto. And Dr. Chant, he encouraged Brideson that they should form a permanent group to look into pollution. So in February 1969, Brideson wrote another article in the varsity, this time encouraging anyone else who was concerned about pollution to come to a meeting with the intent of forming a permanent group. Now, hundreds of people come out to this and Pollution Probe is born. The name Pollution Probe, of course, comes from, well, the title of some articles that Sherry Brideson wrote about this issue. So there's a picture of Donald Champ there. Now you can ask yourself, who joined Pollution Probe? And, well, my response to you would be, lots of people joined it, and from all kinds of walks of life. It's a good cross-section of the University of Toronto faculty, but even more so the students. Now, Dr. Chant, you see there, he made Pollution Probe a project of the Department of Zoology, which means they got free office space, they got free phone line, furniture, mail services. Most of all, it gave them a boost in credibility being affiliated with the Zoology Department. Now, while Dr. Chant's support is vital to the group's success, it has to be noted that it's the students who make the, deci the decisions and run the group. And as I mentioned, there's a large cross-section membership within Pollution Probe, but a major influence is students from elite backgrounds. So Sherry Brideson, who I just mentioned, she's the granddaughter of Roy Thompson, the first Baron of Fleet, the founder of the Thompson Corporation and Canada's wealthiest individual. Many other leaders early on, especially the energetic and popular Tony Barrett, were graduates of Upper Canada College. As Dr. Ralph Brinkhurst, one of the early faculty supervisors, noted regarding the early pollution probe leadership, one of the most impressive things was that they couldn't be dismissed as hairy radicals because they were all so conformist looking, clean, short haircuts, all the right accents. So again, that won't describe all the members, but he's describing the leadership there. And so what does this mean? Well, from the outset, Pollution Probe looked to work with people in power, whether it be industry or politicians. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be critical, but they're always looking to build constructive alliances when at all possible. Pollution Probe first gained some renown within the local media in the summer of 1969. At this point, dozens of dead mallard ducks washed ashore off the Toronto Islands. A resident of Algonquin Island, he saw some 
employees of the city parks department spraying chemicals at the time. So he phoned up the parks department, asked what they were spraying, and he was told it was diazinon, a pesticide that causes death through the overstimulation of neurotransmitters. Shortly thereafter, Tommy Thompson, the superintendent of parks, publicly confirmed that it was diazinon that was being sprayed. Events escalated in June when another 11 dead ducks were found in the waters surrounding the Toronto Islands. These ducks were sent to the Department of Physiological Hygiene at the University of Toronto for analysis, and test results came back showing that diazinon, as high as 66 parts per million, could be found in the mallards. According to Dr. Chant, this was the highest level of diazinon ever recorded anywhere in the world. So in these circumstances, Pollution Probe announced they're holding a public inquiry at City Hall, two-day event in June, uh, I should say July of 1969. Now this event has three high-profile commissioners running it. Uh, one, Dr. Ernest Surluck, he's the Dean of Graduate Studies at the University of Toronto. Another, Dr. Robert McClure, he's the moderator of the United Church of Canada. And the third is Dr. Marshall McLuhan, the director of the University of Toronto's Center for Culture and Technology, and possibly the world's most famous academic at that particular time. So, after going through testimony of people involved and looking at the test results from the University of Toronto, the commissioners came to the conclusion that these ducks were indeed killed by diazinon, and the reckless use of diazinon at that. Now, sufficient controversy emerged that a Royal Commission on Pesticides was held in December. Now, this is the, the part that is either excellent or disappointing, because it turns out there was no diazinon, and this was all one barrel of confusion. The parks employee who told the person that there was diazinon being sprayed on the islands he didn't know what he was talking about. He was answering a phone call, looked at the wall, saw a list of uh, various pesticides, and picked one. <laughs> Tommy Thompson, almost as soon as he confirmed that diazinon was sprayed on the islands, changed his mind and decided there was no proof that diazinon had been sprayed. The person who tested the dead mallard ducks and showed world record levels of diazinon in them. It was a junior scholar who had never done that test before and absolutely botched the project. So, uh, in this respect, Pollution Probe, well, they're wrong, but it worked out for them in the end. They're tapping into existing concerns about synthetic chemicals, of course. There's the famous book, 1962, Silent Spring by uh, Rachel Carson, which is all about this. And as one of the Pollution Probe members at the time told me, our tilting at windmills actually raised our profile. So suddenly, they're very well known in the community. And even if they're, well, wrong on the issue, ultimately, they gained a lot of respect for their, well, hard work. And one of the people who's watching all of this unfold is Terry O'Malley, the Vice President and Creative Director at Vickers & Benson's advertising agency in Toronto. Now, if you're a fan of Mad Men, his job, he's basically the Don Draper of Vickers & Benson. Which, <laughs> he's the one who drew the analogy for me. <laughs> Same job, all that. Now this is a major advertising agency. They ran Pierre Trudeau's election campaign. They also have as clients Ford, McDonald's, uh, Gulf Oil. And Terry O'Malley was very happy with what he saw these young people doing, or a bunch of young people spending a lot of time and energy doing something for the public good. So he offered up his agency's services for free. Now the problem is, sure, they're getting free advertising materials made up, but they don't have money to run the necessary ad campaign. Of course, this doesn't deter Tony Barrett, the eternal optimist, who began a quest to, well, 
wrestle out some free space in one of the Toronto daily newspapers. So quickly got shot down by the Globe and Mail and the Star, but unwilling to quit, he went to what at the time was the third daily in Toronto, the Telegram. He talked his way into a meeting with the owner publisher, John Bassett, and walked away with promise of free full page advertising space. So their first ad ran the 29th of September, 1969. That's an image of it right there. So you see under the heading, which is how would you like a glass of Don River water, the ad has a black and white photo of a glass that contains actual Don River water. So accompanying this is a description of the river's contents, an appeal for the public to raise their concerns with elected politicians, as well as an address where people who support the work of Pollution Probe can send financial donations. This is also the first time the Pollution Probe was able to use their new slogan that Vickers and Benson came up with, which is, do it. You can see that down in the bottom, do it, Pollution Probe at the University of Toronto. Now these advertisements, full page ads, would appear in the Telegram until it shut down in October of 1971. The Don River would also figure prominently into Pollution Probe's next major campaign. Of course, the Don River runs through the city and it's long been a major waste sink for the city. Now I guess most people had resigned themselves to that fact, but the people at Pollution Probe weren't content to let that issue slide. Of course, contemporary events show that people in the United States are starting to change their attitudes towards the health of their waterways. A recent fire in the Cuyahoga River garnered national attention. Likewise, that summer saw the maiden voyage of the Sloop Clearwater, a vessel designed to draw public attention to the efforts underway to revive the Hudson River ecosystem. Now, in order to draw attention to the Don, as well as the fragility of water ecosystems everywhere, pollution probes decide, well, they're going to hold a mock funeral for the river. This is held on Sunday, November 16th, 1969, and it begins at the University of Toronto with a 100-car procession, complete with a hearse, from the University of Toronto's Convocation Hall to the Prince Edward Viaduct. Represented by a black makeshift makeshift casket, the Don River was then carried to the riverbank where it received a 40-minute funeral ceremony presided over by a campus chaplain. Attended by an estimated 200 mourners, those gathered listened to the description of the river's past grandeur read from the diary of Elizabeth Simcoe, the wife of Upper Canada's first lieutenant governor. The funeral featured costume individuals playing the roles of weeping mourners, as well as Sir Simon Greed, a wealthy industrialist played by Tony Barrett, who was decked out in a top hat and a tailcoat. And he proceeded to deride those in attendance, speaking about the virtue of development and minimizing the significance of pollution. At the end of his speech, Tony Barrett, or Sir Simon Greed, if you prefer. He's pied in the face by one of his colleagues to the crowd's applause. And following this, they toss a wreath into the river, and the funeral is over. Now, these guerrilla, guerrilla tactics captured front page coverage in the Globe and Mail, national television coverage on W5 and the CTV National News, as well as spots in the local CBC and CTV television news, the Toronto Star, and the Telegram. So again, they're managing to boost their profile, and in this case, they're getting some national coverage. The next major issue, which managed to solidify their national profile, they weighed in on the already brewing debate concerning phosphate content in detergents. Now, during the first half of the 1960s, Canada and the United States dealt with the problem of excess foaming in the Great Lakes, a problem that was resolved when industry switched to a biodegradable formula. But no sooner had this been resolved than concern shifted to the problem of cultural eutrophication. 
In December 1965, the International Joint Commission, the IJAC, which is an intergovernmental body assigned to resolve issues concerning Canadian-American boundary waters, they urged the respective governments to immediately reduce the amount of phosphate discharged into the waterways. However, these recommendations weren't binding, and little progress was made on the issue. The IJC issued a follow-up report in October 1969, again recommending the lowering of phosphate levels in detergents. And this, of course, is well, opposed by the detergent industry, which countered that the best solution would be to improve sewage treatment facilities. So rather than waiting for the levels of government to come to an agreement, members of Pollution Probe decided that it would be best if they took it upon themselves to break the deadlock. So during the Christmas 1969 holidays, a group of members led by Brian Kelly spent their holiday in a laboratory analyzing the phosphate content of laundry detergents. These results were verified by government and industry scientists and released during a 12-minute segment of CBC Television's Weekend. So that's an image there. Uh, what you see closest to me, that's Brian Kelly, and beside him is Peter Middleton, and the far side are the two hosts. When asked how consumers should proceed, Middleton urged them to use the low phosphate options, noting that the figures are out now, the consumer can make an intelligent choice. So here's that idea of, it's, if you really care about the environment, do something about it yourself. Don't wait for other people to address the issue. Which goes back to Pollution Probe's slogan, do it. By the end of March 1970, over 7,000 requests for copies of the list poured into Pollution Probe's mailroom. It was also reprinted in numerous magazines and newsletters. And consumer demand was so significant that copies of the list were prominently displayed in Loblaws, Dominions, and Dominion, and Steinberg's grocery stores. The day after the list was released, the Ontario government announced it would reduce phosphate levels. And this is followed shortly thereafter by an agreement between the province and the federal government to incorporate phosphate limits into the Canada Water Act. Now, it's true that the federal government was already in the process of addressing the IJC's recommendations, and Ontario was considering following suit. But as Jennifer Reed wrote about Pollution Probe, they helped to concentrate public concern and kept the issue before the government while the parliamentary committee considered the legislation. And possibly the greatest impact here was among consumers. What we see following the release of the list is that high phosphate detergents began to lose their market share to the low phosphate options. And this was brought to life in the April 1970 edition of Maclean's magazine, which documented the list's impact on West Hill, Ontario housewife Rita Boston. Not only did Miss Boston switch to a less harmful detergent, but she also convinced her Amway sales lady to do likewise. Now, a telling sign of Pollution Probe's rising status can be gleaned from the pages of the Globe and Mail. In November 1969, provincial liberal leader Robert Nixon incorporated Pollution Probe into a speech that he gave to students, stating that every campus in the province should have a branch of the organization operating. In March of 1970, the Globe featured a cover story about Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, who we see here, attending a fundraiser at the Royal York Hotel. The accompanying photograph features Trudeau examining one of Pollution Probe's do-it buttons, which he had just been handed. As was noted, after the dinner, the Prime Minister danced to the music of Ellis McClintock and the flashes of photographers. He wore a pink carnation and a do-it button. Two months later, opposition leader Robert Stanfield was in Toronto drumming up support. It was also noted that while he toured environmentally themed displays in Nathan Phillips Square, he was sporting a Pollution Fighter's Do It button. So Pollution Probes find themselves, well, 
being connected to very high profile politicians at this time. And unfortunately, that picture is very, uh, well, looks like it's been photocopied a number of times. It hasn't, but hey, that's what it looks like. In 1970, the decision was made to make Pollution Probe a full-time group, complete with paid staff, whereas they'd been previously operating solely on the basis of student volunteers. It was felt that if they really wanted to continue growing, they'd have to get some full-time paid staff. So four full-timers were hired. Each was budgeted to make $500 a month. Although a lack of cash flow meant that, in reality, they were being paid just half of that. Of the initial hires, Peter Middleton, at age 25, was the oldest. Now, Peter had just started a PhD in French at the University of Toronto when he was drawn to Pollution Probe. So he had been working at that time as a don at the uh, Victoria College residence. And living off that money, he began to volunteer full-time with Pollution Probe. That is, until he actually begins to draw a salary from them. And you can see, actually, paid staff, three of them are in this picture. That's Tony Barrett wearing a military helmet. To his left is Peter Middleton. Again, to his left is Brian Kelly. So that's three of the first four paid employees. So they have ambitions to grow the organization, but they need more money. This leads them to seek funds from the business community. Initially, support came from the inner circle. What I mean by this, Pollution Probe's first major corporate donation came in autumn 1969 from the North America Life Assurance Company, whose vice president of finance was a family friend of one of the Pollution Probe leaders. Another early and important contact is Gage Love, the former chairman of the Toronto Board of Trade. His son Peter and his daughter-in-law Anne were among the first Pollution Probe members. Pollution Probe was even able to derive support from a company with which it waged a public battle. In the aftermath of the phosphate campaign, Tony Barrett arranged a meeting with himself Brian Kelly, and the president of Procter & Gamble's Canadian Operations. As Kelly told me, we went in and he certainly acknowledged the impact the phosphate campaign had had on Procter & Gamble. Towards the end of the meeting, he reached into the desk drawer, pulled out an envelope, slid it across the table to Tony and said, here, go and kick some more corporate ass. <laughs> Inside that envelope was a check for $5,000. In a way, the relationship Pollution Probe had with the business community was ahead of its time. Now, ENGOs in the United States generally didn't begin embracing corporate support until the 1980s. If you look at the Sierra Club in the United States, in the mid-1970s, they derived 70% of their revenue from membership dues, sale of merchandise, and wilderness outings. So by April 1970, Pollution Probe had grown into a major presence in the city. They had 1,500 members, four full-time coordinators, a secretary, and an office manager. They also managed to be a magnet for media attention, averaging an appearance once a week in the Globe and Mail and twice a week in the Toronto Star. Despite the attention devoted to their activities, they continued to emphasize the message that everybody had the ability to do good work on behalf of the environment. This could be something as simple as being conscientious about the amount of waste produced, or by writing a letter to a politician. And this message of personal agency led Pollution Probe to encourage those living outside of Toronto to develop their own independently operated affiliates. It was felt that having a network of pollution probes in Ontario and across the country would have help spread the heavy workload and strengthen the recognition of the Pollution Probe brand. So a guidebook, a manual, if you will, for this process was created, sent out to interested parties. Affiliates shortly thereafter begin to pop up. The greatest concentration of these affiliates is in southern Ontario, where by the end of 1971, there's 50 
pollution probe affiliates. And they're found as far west as Regina, Saskatchewan, and as far east as Moncton, New Brunswick. Now these groups vary greatly. Some were rather small, run by a couple of keeners. Others, such as the affiliate at Carleton University, featured a paid staff. Others managed to carve out specific niches for themselves. The affiliate in Peterborough was responsible for starting alternatives, our Canadian Environmental Studies Journal, while the Kitchener-Waterloo group made some major significant contributions to the advancement of recycling in the province. The sheer number of pollution probe affiliates that emerged in Canada during this time demonstrates the prominence of the University of Toronto-based group. It also indicates that the country's environmentalists saw the appropriation of the name pollution probe as a source of credibility. In addition to its affiliates, Pollution Probe played an important role fostering the development of other environmental organizations. The first was the Canadian Association of the Human Environment, or CAHI. Launched at a national convention in September 1970 and headed by Pollution Probe's Peter Middleton, CAHI served as an umbrella group representing ENGOs from nine of the ten provinces. Now the sole purpose of this group was to create an infrastructure necessary to maximize the amount of money they got from uh, make work programs that the federal government had, such as the local initiatives program and opportunities for youth. And when those funds dried up, the group, well, dissolved. It also becomes apparent at this point that the legal system is a great untapped uh, resource. So at that point, Pollution Probe begins to recruit interested parties from Toronto's law schools. So Alan Levy, one of the recruits, explained, the concept was to create a public interest law clinic that could provide support for environmental groups that needed expertise at little or no cost. Now this leads to the creation of the Canadian Environmental Law Association, the first organization of its kind in Canada. picture here is a Vickers and Benson ad that was created for a local group. It was bringing together community organizations and it was called COPE. It didn't really go anywhere, but I like the poster. That cartoon, the main part of it is Pollution Probe working very hard, fighting pollution, digging holes in the ground, and they look very sweaty and tired, and off in the distance, the cavalry coming in to support them. So. Although that group didn't really go anywhere, well, we can remember them for this great poster. And Pollution Probe's success in the early 70s didn't go unnoticed by other environmental groups. Its high media profile and fundraising prowess resulted in a steady stream of requests for advice. In response to these requests, Pollution Probe dispatched its staff to hold workshops with ENGOs across the country. We're talking they go all the way to BC, to Halifax, pretty much everywhere in between. While these workshops tended to emphasize Pollution Probe's approach to fundraising, its organizational structure and its relationship with the media were other common topics. Anyhow, that's generally what I wanted to talk about, this early stage of Pollution Probe. This is coming from early part of my dissertation and upcoming book. If you want to know the rest of the story, well, the dissertation's out there. Or you could wait for the book, I suppose. Or talk to me afterwards, which is a novel idea. But just to do a, a brief coming up to the modern day, Pollution Pro continues to grow in scope and size. By October 1973, they have 25 full-time paid staff. They develop a team structure and expand their interests beyond traditional pollution concerns to include land use planning, uh, energy and resources, and this is something that they were addressing before the 1973 energy crisis. Environmental justice and recycling, these are all issues they're addressing. Of course, they had to deal with declining funding for environmental groups that occurred as the 70s wore on. 
By 1975, the Energy and Resources team developed into a sister organization, that's Energy Probe, which was better able to fund its activities in the wake of the energy crisis. A note on that, by the early 1980s, Pollution Probe and Energy Probe sever their relationship. This is, again, due to budget issues. And this is a time before Energy Probe is, well, developed its reputation as a free market think tank, which is what it's really known for now. So, Pollution Probe, they still exist. There's their new logo. I shouldn't say new, it's their current logo. And they continue to work behind the scenes, seeking solutions with stakeholders. Most public of their activities is the clean air commute, you may be familiar with. I believe that's coming up in June. And all of its affiliates have since seized operations. I'll point out that Pollution Probe still operates as a mainstream organization, noticeably void of radicals and troublemakers. And contrary to what certain members of our government want us to believe, this is the rule, I believe, rather than the exception within the contemporary environmental movement in Canada. January 2012, Natural Resource Minister Joe Oliver, while discussing opposition to Enbridge's Northern Gateway Pipeline, he spoke openly about environmental and other radical groups that threaten to hijack our regulatory system to achieve their radical ideological agenda. And he also accused environmentalists in this country of being funded from outside the country. The following month, Public Safety Minister Vic Taves released a new anti-terrorism strategy that listed environmentalists among perceived threats. And amidst this Increasing attention of the government and their hostility towards the environmental movement, the Globe and Mail uncovered a CSIS document. The program is certainly one that has a lot of resonances with what we do in the Frost Center. Um, he's currently preparing a manuscript um, with a very good press, UBC Press, which is the one that I'm uh, uh, working with currently at the moment, too. Uh, his book is called Toronto the Green, The Origins of Canada's Environmental Movement and I think it's based uh, on his dissertation. While uh, at Trent, he worked with uh, Stephen Balking to uh, edit a volume called The Great Green North, The History of Canada's Environmental Movement. He's well published for such a young scholar. I recently had a piece come out in Ontario History, um, Acadiensis, uh, and various other uh, uh, publications, and has been active also in the community, I think, working on this topic. Tonight's event, uh, tonight's lecture, is also part of the Peterborough Community Foundation's uh, Seven Days of Green, uh, and we have the Executive Director from the Foundation with us uh, this evening. Um, a, and a series of events leading up to Earth Day uh, that are happening in the community, uh, and, it's, and uh, you can check their website to find out more details if you want. But this, this talk had actually been organized earlier in the, in the year. Uh, Ryan O'Connor is a research fellow in the Frost Center and um, suggested that he would be willing to give uh, a talk on his research, uh, living up to the expectations that the Frost Center has of their research associates and willingly acknowledges their contributions to all that we do. Uh, so I was very pleased um, and it was his suggestion that we organize it uh, in and around Earth Day, which seemed most appropriate. Ryan uh, has been at Trent as a Shirk postdoc, uh, working with Stephen Bocking um, uh, over the last couple of years. He has his PhD from the University of Western Ontario, uh, where he worked with Ellen McEachern, and his uh, MA from Queens, and he's originally from PEI, and that will connect with at least one person I know in the audience. And his undergraduate degree uh, is, in, is from the University of Prince Edward Island. And from what I could read of your work, it was in island studies. So you did a lot of work on, on, on history, uh, and uh, that program there, the island, um, I think, draws you into the public uh, and the public discussion around uh, issues around uh, environmental activism and, and uh, its history and its ongoing, uh, the ongoing need, I would say.
Riot's talk tonight is called Pollution Probe and the Not-So-Secret Beginnings of Environmental Activism in Ontario, and I'd like to ask you to uh, help me welcome him tonight. Where I'd like to begin is to bring it to the present, and the fact is it seems that there's no secret that our government holds the environmental movement, well, in a hostile stance, right? They seem to be portraying environmentalists as radicals and troublemakers. Just give you a few examples.